Welcome to a Data 601 lecture on cost-benefit analysis and ethics. My name is Ben and this is the last lecture of Data 601. So there are a lot of slides in this. I'll be talking through quite a uh, bit of content. So um, please pause the video if you have some thoughts that you want to write down or come back to later. This will be the last lecture. After this, the final project presentations are on May 20th. Um, the notebooks for that are due uh, in Blackboard on May 21st. And the uh, selections of who's presenting on May 20th are by lottery. All right, so we're gonna talk about a, an issue specific to Data 601. Um, so hopefully you find it relevant. Uh, this is the issue of plagiarism, where uh, students have either collaborated with each other or uh, found work that, that they have not cited and then used in class. Specifically in this 601 section, those are not allowed, um, but people do that on both uh, in previous semesters and this semester. So um, this is an issue that I bring back up specifically for uh, to describe to you how this issue is relevant in a cost-benefit mindset. So for a little bit of context, when there is a suspected plagiarism issue, this is the process I go through to sort of detect and then report it. So I uh, manually grade all the homework submissions anonymously, and then if I see some issue, I may run some software to investigate the similarity of that code. And then I manually inspect the results, and then I have a bunch of conversations with people all across the university, including the student. So <laughs> I'll give you, uh, I'll point out that this is a, a very common feature of data science where there's a bunch of manual and social work and then a little bit of it involves some software. Um, so this typically gets a lot of attention, the, the software aspect, but most of my time gets spent in the manual and social processes. The other thing to think about in this um, story is that there are actually a lot of people involved, not just the person who took the action uh, of plagiarizing work, but also other students and the course instructor and the department chairperson and UMBC as an organization overall. Even though the, the decision to act or not act was specific to one person. The, the, I've already mentioned the manual sort of processes and the social interactions and the Python code used to analyze uh, homeworks. But the other big relevant thing is to, to, to recognize that there is an emotional component to all this. It's not just, you know, cold hearted running uh, code and making decisions. It's also the emotional decision making process that goes into plagiarism, as well as after the after the action, um, there is some some maybe fear or anxiety of being caught, right, or depression. So all of these emotions are, are running throughout the course of this uh, story. So if you were to think of all the things I just told you in the terms of a cost-benefit analysis, some things that you might want to layer into that um, set of uh, observations is that there are some benefits to, to collaboration, right? So maybe students have better relationships um, if they work together. And potentially, the work that you do takes less time because you're collaborating. So that's a, an example of a short-term outcome. In the long term, uh, you may have less of the skills you actually desire. Uh, and then lastly, the other common theme to recognize in a cost-benefit analysis is risk. So risk here could be applied to both the idea of um, what are the consequences as well as the sort of upfront decision making of, you know, am I willing to take this risk um, before I take this action? The reason risk is usually hard to uh, understand is because, you know, in this specific case, what penalties get applied are, are up to the instructor. Um, it's a subjective question and that makes quantifying the risk very difficult. Okay, so I just gave you a bunch of sort of things to think about in the context of 601 um, and then hopefully you make the right decision, right? That is, 
that is the recurring sort of reason that one does cost-benefit analysis is to figure out what action should I take. Once you leave UMBC, you'll be in a different context. You'll be probably working in a large organization or a small company. I'll make the claim um, that all of these organizations, large or small, regardless of what you do, speak a single language. I'll ask what what that what is that language, right? So I'm gonna claim, this is my own answer, right, that of reorganization, regardless, regardless of whether it's commercial or nonprofit or governmental or research oriented, they all speak money. What's the relevance there to you? You're a data scientist, right? The relevance as a data scientist is doing the analysis and you know making a report of the what the outcome is is useful but not sufficient to, to drive decision making in a business. You need to be able to relate your analysis to what decisions the management should make and what choice they should select. So you're going to have to relate you know, all the work you just did in your Python code to the actual decision that the business should make. That claim of you know, like you're going to have to do the business sort of integration task of your data science work applies regardless of whether it's commercial business where it's very easy to understand, you know, am I making more money or less money? It also applies in the context of uh, if you're in the government where you're not you know, specifically profit driven, you still have to worry about um, are we doing the most work that we can given our budget or can we get more budget? And then if you're in a research or academic environment, you still have to be able to understand how much work can I do given a certain amount of money? What grants should I chase? And what sort of staffing should I uh, pursue? These are all questions um, regardless of which context you're in. And um, if you want to sort of tie this in with the most current sort of uh, hot topic in data science as far as business integration, you should look up the, the phrase data-driven decisions. Um, it's a very uh, you know, appealing idea in the sense that typically uh, you know, a, a, a manager may be making very subjective decisions uh, without a lot of data, you know, merely based on their experience or what they've heard. And so data science really offers this uh, concept that you could potentially have better informed decisions through collection and analysis of data. That doesn't always work out that, that way, and I'm willing to you know share stories as you see fit, but um, there, there, there is a reason why data science is interesting within the context of business. All right, so we've talked a little bit about you know why you as a data scientist might need to think in terms of uh, cost and benefit and risk. Now I'm gonna give you basically a recipe for how to do that. So I'll give you basically a set of questions to ask, and these questions are you know, initially relatively straightforward, but I'll give you the reason why they're relevant to ask. So in the 601 example of plagiarism, I already um, you know, told you, gave you an example where knowing who the stakeholders are matters to uh, what drives your, your cost-benefit model. So if, if you think that you're audience or stakeholders are just a, the student who's doing the plagiarism, then you might make a different analysis compared to recognizing that a, you know, a collection of students acting uh, negatively may, neg may harm the reputation of the organization. Right? That, that question of who is the stakeholder drives what is the relevance of the cost-benefit model. Um, an example of fixed cost is if you're doing sort of uh, think if you're thinking about things like operations and maintenance versus research versus uh, non-recurring engineering um, versus capital costs, um, these costs um, are usually easy to um, quantify once you've had a specific example of what you're looking at, but initially they're they're very hard to develop. Um, 
think number two is really interesting but often overlooked as far as the problem that you're investigating that you're developing the cost benefit model for probably has been attacked or at least recognized before and someone before you has tried to uh, address it. And obviously they weren't successful because the problem is still there. So then the question becomes, why did they fail or why was their approach incomplete or unsuccessful? Um, if you can do that, you can learn about what mistakes to avoid or at least not to repeat. Uh, and then, you know, the common sort of challenges of when you're developing a cost benefit model, you should definitely think about what am I going to apply it for? What's the relevance of this, right? This is sort of thinking outside of just, you know, someone told me to do something, I should do that. You should brainstorm what, what else can I do with this model? And once you've got your model developed, then you can say, uh, you know, what are the options that I face and why would I choose one versus the other? And then if you don't do something, that's another option. So how do we carry that out? Those are a bunch of questions to ask. That's like the, the, the relevant aspects of a cost benefit model, but how do we do it? The first step is to really ask what question is gonna drive us. And this may be as easy as a manager asking you, the data scientist, hey, I have a question about X, what should we do? And then you can say, well, here's a cost benefit model for you. That almost, in my experience, never happens. No one ever comes to me and says, Ben, I have this problem, can you help me solve it? <laughs> I have to go out and figure out what do other people work on and why are they doing it and what questions should they be asking? Right? So typically, um, people enjoy doing their job the way they've always done it. And so then my role as a data scientist is to figure out, hey, could we do something better? Could we do something different? And what would be the cost benefit of that action or inaction? So recognizing what questions there are isn't always straightforward. Then once you've sort of come up with, okay, this is the question I want to address, then you can develop a relation between the variables that you've identified and evaluate the cost, benefits, and risk, um, hopefully referencing what has done before. Um, if you can sort of cite previous work that can build people's confidence in your outcome. And then this is where I get uh, mo this is where I spend most of my time. I have to find the data that goes into the model. So identify you know, steps uh, two and three are relatively straightforward. They're saying there is a relationship between these variables. That's a claim. But then number four is I have to feed that model with some data to validate the model or make an extrapolation or prediction. Now, why would getting data for your model take so much time? It's typically due to the fact that the question you're asking with your model has not been asked before uh, or has not been at least investigated the way you're doing it. And that means that there's a set of challenges that are specific to the act of novelty, right? So like you have some data that you're chasing and therefore you have a data policy um, that doesn't exist yet. And then your, your organization has to respond with creation of policy, which invariably takes a lot of time and you have to explain why you're doing this and justify it. And so there's lots of sort of bureaucratic momentum that you need to overcome. Additionally, there may be some technical issues. You literally don't know where to get the data to feed your model. Um, and then once you get it, maybe you don't trust it and you need to figure out, is this data realistic? So there's a lot of sort of aspects data collection that inform the cost benefit model that are not uh, very easy. All right, so once we sort of lay all that uh, process out, we realize that the part of analyzing the data that only takes a little bit of time, right? So again, just like we saw in the 601 plagiarism example, the step of applying my coding skills while definitely necessary, is not sufficient to doing this work. So the reason that one does a cost-benefit analysis is to evaluate different options. And that uh, comparison is usually referred to um, 
when you find that two options are equivalent is called the break-even point. So the break-even point can be in the context of how long should I do something, right? Um, and I'll give an example of that later in a notebook. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll defer some of this context of a break-even point to the notebook analysis. When you're developing your model, um, your, you will face a set of choices. Uh, an example of the choice that you have is, should I have a really simple model or should the model be more nuanced? Should it account for more aspects? Should it be more complicated? So there's some non-quantifiable benefits to simplicity. So for example, explainability. And right? if you want to explain your model to the customer or the management or I don't know, the, an overseer, simplicity is desirable. It also has um, value in being quick, right? So if your model only takes a few seconds to run, you can do many iterations and improve it that way. However, I often see data scientists get caught up in this issue of, well, this simple model, although it's helpful, doesn't take advantage of all the programming and math skills that I've invested in, you know, as, as a data scientist. <laughs> well, again, it's not really the goal of the data scientists to use all their skills. It's the goal of the data scientists to inform the organization's decision-making process. So just because a simple model works but doesn't satisfy your needs, doesn't mean you should move on to a complicated model. There are reasons to uh, use more complex models in the sense that they may explain more edge cases, they may uh, be able to handle situations that simple models can't, but I'm going to argue that sometimes a simple model does have benefit, uh, it requires less computation, uh, which can cost less, and it also um, may get you most of the right answer. So adding complexity to get sort of a very incremental improvement in the outcome usually is not useful. All right, so we've given you a recipe for how to do cost-benefit analysis. We've given you a couple of motives about why you'd want to do that in business in 601. Now we'll talk about the, the common paradigms, the, the common trade-offs that I see cost-benefit being used in. So, uh, an example of like, why does the cloud work, right? So I'll give you sort of the, the mindset that got us to cloud. And that is, it used to be historically that we would buy really big computers and we'd spend a bunch of money to make them work really well. And then there was a, a change. The change was that we realized we could build really big computers out of a bunch of unreliable components. So rather than like spending a huge amount of money to make a really perfect computer, we could spend less money and have a bunch of unreliable computers, but build them together using software that accounted for that unreliability. And it turns out by spending, uh, by, by focusing less on the reliability of the hardware and more on the resilience of the software, that we could save money. And that's how cloud um, computing took off um, like a, you know, a decade or two ago, uh, where we really saw growth in computing in terms of scale. So what, what drove that, right? It was this cost-benefit analysis of resilience and uh, reliability versus money. That was the driver. All right. So some other examples, you know, money isn't always the sort of... Um, driver, sometimes it's how long should I do something for? Her? What is the time perspective which I should take? Should I be focused on the long term versus the short term? Um, another very common cost benefit analysis to make is localized versus decentralized. And like, um, so my favorite example of this is the IT department, right? The, the tech support, should it be local within every sort of uh, branch organization? or should there be a central IT department, right? And that commonly swings back and forth about every 10 to 15 years of, if you're in a large organization, you'll see over time IT departments centralize and then people get dissatisfied and they'll decentralize and then people will get dissatisfied and then they'll centralize again. Um, and so this is a, 
uh, a process that goes back and forth that people are making arguments for and collecting evidence against uh, various cases. Um, another uh, choice to, that people face is whether to have things, um, uh, art, we'll call it artisan, I like the, the idea of sort of customized, right, versus uh, again centralized and sort of uh, consistent. Um, so again there's a trade-off there of uh, do you have uh, something that is very common and everybody has to fit to the lowest common denominator or do you have something that's highly specialized? Um, so an example of this that is very relevant currently is that uh, there's this trade-off of everyone doing their own thing in their own car, that's what we most of us have, versus self-driving cars. Self-driving cars, um, you might not recognize, everyone is using the same algorithm and, and therefore the con driving habit is very consistent, it's very predictable. But that one size fits all approach may not be uh, viable for all the different environments that we operate in. Um, and then <laughs> another sort of very, very easy example to think about is, should I exercise at home? Should I buy my own weight equipment, right, access it whenever I want, or should I pay for a membership at a gym? All right, so how does this apply? You know, not to, so 601 maybe is where you'll uh, get skills developing the model, but the reason that you'll probably use uh, the model is in uh, potentially machine learning, right? If you wanna say, I'm gonna spend a bunch of money on GPUs, I'm gonna invest months of time, is it worth it? Right? That's a cost benefit analysis to make. Then you, another sort of common factor is, you know, how much time should I spend on my model's training um, versus uh, you know, actually delivering an outcome to my customers more quickly with potentially lower uh, accuracy. So a very hands-on example of that is um, there have been people where they're driving their car, it's trying to self-navigate, and it's not effective. Um, and so then you ask the question, well, maybe they deployed that model prematurely, right? Uh, and so this is a trade-off, right? Do you deploy the model before it's ready and potentially risk someone's lives or maybe a crash or some, some harm? Or do you, uh, you know, wait until it is perfected and potentially lose your business advantage? All right, so now we will try and um, take all that sort of abstract stuff I've been talking at you about and apply it. So. I'm going to give you three scenarios where these are common questions I think you'll be faced with um, and I'm going to have you vote for which one of them since you're not you know, actually able to participate I'll vote for you and we'll say number two. So number two is I'm a business and I'm going to have to face this decision of should I invest work in this project that may or may not you know, result in some customer base uh, taking advantage of the outcome. Now you'll notice all of these that I framed are, di are two choice outcomes, right? And, and my warning to you is that whenever, you see, whenever someone presents you or you recognize some choice that there is to be made and someone says, here's two choices, you should stop, right? Stop everything and brainstorm. Um, so you wanna come up with alternatives. There's you know four, maybe six or eight choices. And so your cost benefit model should be able to handle not just the two choices you're confronted with, but some analysis of the, all the alternatives that are viable. So for this slide set, I'm gonna ignore that, you know, my own advice. I'm just gonna compare the two choices that I'm given, but I would advocate that when you're evaluating different choices, you brainstorm alternative options. So the other thing that I'll throw out before I actually get started on my task of evaluating the project is um, quantification uh, involves actually getting data, not just making up numbers. Right. So now I'm going to talk about uh, my 
my task here. Um, again, I'll list out that there are cost benefits and risk for each thing, and then I'll try and figure out, you know, what are, if I invest in a project, maybe uh, it gets me some advancement in my organization. Um, and if I don't invest in a project, you know, there's less risk, therefore I save money. Um, but maybe I miss all the potential gains associated with that, that opportunity. So once you've sort of brainstormed the cost benefits and risk, then you can say which ones are quantifiable and which ones are not. These are now our variables. So the, the quantifiable factors that went into our brainstorming are something that we can build a model around. So ideally, um, again, just to sort of disclaimer, you actually want to have a whole bunch of options. Maybe you can invest in a smaller project or a larger project or no project, for example. Um, but then you're going to have to go out and get data around these quantifiable variables. And then almost always you want to figure out, you know, go back to the person who asked this question and, and get more details. So for example, what is the timeline associated with this task? Right, so we'll skip over this other stuff. Ideally, if you were here in class, then we would give you the task to do a thing that I have not. Um, but since you're not, we'll skip over that part. And then we'll talk with uh, you know other students who did something else. Let's skip over that part. All right. So now we're going to actually take the examples that we were talking about and do them in Python. So as I mentioned, if you have that brainstorming process of cost, benefit, and risk, you identify the quantifiable variables, and then you can identify what the relations are, if any, between the various variables, and then you can go chase that data. Um, when you're telling your story back to your um, audience after having done the analysis, you'll want to include those non those unquantified aspects uh, just to sort of give context for why did you arrive at the model that you have. All right, so I'm going to dive into that fourth example um, that I mentioned, which is should I, you know, given this decision of should I hire additional staff or should I pay uh, existing workers overtime? This is a, a standard sort of decision to make. So as I mentioned, you can enumerate the cost, benefit, and risk of each of these and then quantify those aspects. And I've done that in this notebook. I'm going to switch over to. All right. So this is a, a notebook that I wrote that basically um, evaluates for uh, a given set of employees and, and um, money being spent by a business whether they should hire more people. So if the the motivation for why a business might want to hire people is to get higher productivity, higher more output, right? Um, and you'll see that in a few uh, at towards the end of the cells, you'll see that the timeline matters, which is the question that we we're asking earlier. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm going to start by brainstorming what parameters are relevant. Um, and so if I want to assume that they're employees, I'm going to assume that they're getting paid some hourly rate. I'm going to assume that there's some number of uh, work hours that they have in a day. And then I'm going to make my life as an analyst super easily. I'm going to assume that they produce some countable number of outcomes. So this is almost never the case in a white collar job. But uh, for, you know, for assembly workers or you know, producing something, we'll call them widgets. So we're going to produce widgets, and then I'm going to make another assumption, which is if I bring on a new employee, then while I'm training that employee about how to produce widgets, the rate of production that they have is going to be lower. All right, and then I'm also kind of cap how long it takes them to get trained. So. Over the course of say five days, it takes the person to get up to those three widgets per hour. And then I'm going to sort of have this duration of my analysis. So this is how long I'm going to compare the outcomes for. Okay, so those are basically variables that I've identified that are quantifiable, and I'm just assigning them as Python variables. All right, so then I'm going to construct uh, this 
list of days data structure that basically is my simulation of each day. All right, so now we'll do uh, a little bit of uh, more setup basically where I'm going to count how many widgets are produced by trained workers and new workers and then we'll store those uh, sent uh, into a list and then I'll also record how much money is being spent. Okay, so this basically this cell right here is the simulation. So I'm going to iterate over all the days. So I'm going to look, you know, iterate from 0 to 30. And then I'm going to compare my trained worker, how much money is spent on them for their hourly rate, and how many widgets did they present they create. And then compare that with a new worker. So it's pretty similar. I'm just spending money on them until uh, they are trained. And then once they're trained, then they are producing the standard number of widgets. Okay, so once I've got these lists of um, you know how many days there are in my analysis and how much money is being spent on the workers, then I can plot that result. So it turns out that because I'm paying my existing worker and new worker the same rate, then the money being spent by the business on the workers is the same over those 30 days. So nothing shocking there, we're just spending money. What we really care about though is how many widgets are being produced, right? Because if my business makes money on selling widgets, so therefore I really care about widget production. And so if I plot that over time, what I see is that my worker who is already trained, that's the blue one, um, they're producing widgets at a steady rate. But over those first five days, the rate of production for my untrained worker, while they're in training, it takes a while to get spun up. And so they have to sort of produce at a slower rate. And then once they're trained, they produce at the regular rate, but they'll never catch up with that original worker. So in some sense, we'll never get the same number of widgets out of that new worker. So you're like, okay, we'll just keep the existing worker. That makes more sense. All right, the, the, the never hire anyone new is this sort of chart here. Okay, so the question is really, um, you know, the cost per widget is the metric that we should be evaluating. So if I say that my existing worker is producing widgets and they're already trained, then the cost per widget um, produced is constant. Whereas while the person is in training, they're a new employee, they're producing fewer widgets. So they're, um, the cost per widget is higher. I have to spend more to get that same number of widgets. So after they're trained, then their, uh, their widget cost is decreasing over time, asymptotically approaching the existing worker. All right, so that means hiring new staff is inefficient. But, um, so you know, now we've got our sort of basis for our model. It's validated that the, the model does what we think it should. Um, sort of sanity checks have been passed. Now we wanna ask a different question, which is, should I uh, hire a new worker or should I ex uh, pay my existing workers more overtime to get an increase in the number of widgets? So. Basically, same analysis as before, but now I'm gonna add in overtime. Uh, those are my options. And so now what we see is that uh, if I rerun the same plot, I'm gonna get my existing worker with overtime. They're producing more widgets, but also spending more money. My existing worker working at the, uh, the regular pay rate and then adding in a worker, they still cost more initially. But then eventually, here's the interesting part. I am having this transition point where I see a, that the hiring a new worker is actually going to uh, be equivalent to paying an existing worker overtime after some number of days. So after about three weeks of time, the new worker working with a regular worker will actually catch up with and then be better than the, the having uh, a single worker with overtime. So that is the break even point there. That, that's the interesting part of this analysis. So we can also make a couple other observations. So that, that was like the primary objective. The break even point is at 21 days. If I'm making widgets for only, I need to make extra widgets for only 15 days, then I should just keep the worker uh, with overtime. Whereas if I need 
to produce extra widgets and that is going to last longer than 21 days, then I should hire a new worker. Okay, a couple other sort of interesting aspects to think about. Um, the number of widgets being produced uh, by hiring your extra worker only sort of overtakes the worker with overtime uh, after the training period is done. That's the observation there. Uh, yeah, and then the number of widgets produced um, increased uh, faster once you have that trained worker in, in place. Okay, so that's an example of the sort of cost-benefit analysis that one might do in Python, and to find that that trade-off um, there. More typically, I see a lot of cost-benefit analysis done in Excel, and this is typically what you look like. You have your variables here. Um, same as I laid out in Python, um, and you can even sort of document things like dollars per hour as units. And then, just as I did in the Python notebook, I have my day as a list, right? And then all these other variables here, these are calculations based on other cells, right? And so I can do all the same analysis in Excel, um, and I can get the same actual plots here. So I can see predictions of widgets, and I can get cost of widgets and that sort of thing. So I can make the same plots. The difference between these two, the Python, note, uh, Python notebook and the Excel spreadsheet, is that the Python notebook can be much more flexible to changes. So if I need to adapt this Excel notebook to do a new analysis, I almost essentially have to start over from scratch on an Excel spreadsheet. Whereas if I'm using a Python notebook, I can typically just make a few changes in the code, and rerun the notebook. So the adaptability of your Jupyter Notebook is greater than the Excel spreadsheet, even though this, for a given iteration, the Excel spreadsheet is, is equally comparable. So that was um, basically a movement from the, the brainstorming and quantification to a Python Notebook. All right, so for our second topic for the lecture, and this is like basically a two-part lecture, the second part is on ethics and legality. Again, this happens to be in the cost-benefit uh, lecture, but this is a, a separate topic, so we won't see cost-benefit analysis again for the rest of the lecture, at least not in the quanti quantitative sense. So my disclaimer for the ethics and legality section is I'm not going to try and impose what I think is the right thing to do. I'm just going to provide a bunch of illustrations about situations that may come up um, in some sense in your data science career. My goal is that if you think about these ahead of time, um, you'll be more adept to act in the way that you want rather than sort of rashly reacting. Why do I think that thinking ahead is of value? Well, um, you know, I want you to sort of come up with your own moral framework. I can't really do that too well on Data 601, only spending half of a lecture on it, but I do want you to have some perception of what your own values are. And then how does that set of values that you've come up with interact with other people? And how could it be that other people have different values than you? Right? That is one of the goals of this section. All right, because eventually you're going to, as a data scientist, work with people who you may not agree with and have different perspectives and experiences with you, and you will need to socially navigate that interaction. Okay, so before we get started on the sort of ethics discussions, I'm going to ask you to write down on paper um, what you do when you see someone that you disagree with um, doing something maybe that you don't like. How do you feel about that? How do you rationalize it? Um, and do you engage? And, and under what circumstances would you defer on that? So this is a, an isolated activity doing by yourself. We won't be sharing these notes with each other. Take a little bit of time. All right, so now we'll move on to, uh, once we've got, the, the, the motive for that exercise was for you to figure out 
you know, what do I do and I disagree so that you can think a little ahead, of, ahead about it. If you like doing this sort of activity, um, I'm going to refer you to 605, which is the Ethical and Legal Issues in Data Science. Um, we, we have actually um, an instructor who is dedicated to this, and they cover a lot of the hot topics in data science that are relevant in this area. Okay, so I'll just throw out that there are other courses in this. Um, there is some financial motivation to be aware of this, right? So like the national, and as an example, the National Science Foundation uh, awarded a half million dollar grant um, on this topic. So there is some money in it. All right, so I'm gonna give to you my takeaways. So if, if you don't pay attention to the rest of the lecture, at least this section will tell you what you've missed. All right, so like, as I mentioned, if you can figure out what you're going to do in a situation before that situation arises, you're going to be able to be more capable and more responsible than if you had to come up with an answer on the fly. The reason for that is because when you're faced with the pressures of sort of reacting quickly, you may not react the way that you want in the, in the future. All right, so that was one. Number two is you will run into people that are that don't share your perspective. Um, and, and so you're going to have to figure out what do you do when you disagree with someone? Um, how do you handle that? Um, do you escalate it? Uh, do you report it? Um, maybe are you doing something that someone else doesn't agree with? How do you convince them that what you're doing is reasonable or inconsistent? Um, so this sort of shows up not only personally, but also as an organization. The organization sets policies, and it's good to be aware of these policies, and to develop policies so that other people don't sort of go outside of what the expectations are for the organization. Um, number three is you, so this is specific to data scientists, you are most likely in your organization to be responsible for issues of privacy and security and anonymization of data. You will have access to all the data. You will um, can be combining data that most people don't have access to. Um, and so you're likely to be in the role of having at least input, if not some sort of responsibility for the policy of how that is done. So it's definitely worth being aware of the issues and challenges before you have that responsibility. All right, so why does this matter? Well, it turns out that if you didn't know that something was illegal, you can still go to jail for it or get fined. So liability, um, that's where lawyers show up. Um, you're not a lawyer probably, but uh, as a data scientist, you still need to know what um, possible things you could incur that will, might get you involved with lawyers or the legal system. So educating yourself specifically to the domain you're in so for example, healthcare or education or even just sort of web, web collection metrics, right? So now we have the, the G, GPDDR and we have uh, HIPAA and we have all these different sort of compliance regimes that um, you, will have, you will probably be operating under um, as a data scientist. So you have to be aware of the regulatory frameworks that you're operating within. All right, so those are the major takeaways that I wanted to get across. Now we'll sort of dive into the, the softer sort of aspects of this, this topic. So I mentioned before that you'll likely be responsible for um, sensitive data that may range from anywhere of like personal sort of browsing habits on the web or maybe uh, purchasing habits, right, or maybe uh, ish images that people um, didn't expect to show up on the internet. So it's worth considering what the context of the person who gave you the information is. Do they did they sign a time? Did they have a terms of service that they agreed to? What is in the terms of service? How likely is it that someone actually understood those terms of service that they were agreeing to? Right? So, like when you go to a website and you click on the "I agree for cookies," that's an example of the consumer informing the content owner that they're okay with the data collection. Um, so then that now means that you're responsible for handling um, and managing that data. 
that's an easy example to understand the web. Another one is on the healthcare data. So an example of healthcare data is your medical records. They get shared by not only the hospital, but also the insurance company and maybe some researchers, right? And so like you as a medical patient may not realize that even if you signed all these different waivers and forms. Um, and so uh, <laughs> sometimes if you're going in for a medical uh, scenario, you may not realize that and it may not be a choice that you have. Like your medical record will be created regardless. All right, so what happens? Um, the, all this data gets collected and then people want to make money with it. They want to make some sort of profit. And the way that they do that is they sell it, they repackage it, they rebundle it, they anonymize it. They get it out the door to someone else who can aggregate it with something that they have and make more money off of it. Um, so this is the sort of common data scientist role of not just analyzing data, but sort of adding value to it um, and aggregating it. So if a relatively uh, recent example of this that hopefully people have heard of um, still is the Cambridge Analytica, where the Facebook profile data was being uh, sent for political purposes to different organizations. Um, and again, even if you don't work with outside data, you may have uh, HR records, you may have personnel files, um, sort of budgetary information, all this sort of sensitive organization information. And you're being in the responsible position of aggregating that data to get value out of the combination and historical analysis of it. Typically, you want to predict something or find an anomaly. That means you need a lot of data. Okay, we're going to skip over this activity uh, and then uh, we'll, yeah, we'll move on to the rest of the slides here. All right, so the activity basically was uh, you're given a situation where someone disagrees with you, how do you handle it? Well, normally what I um, observe is that when something bad happens, uh, so you've got all this data collected and something bad is happening, the initial response that people have is they ignore it. And they ignore it for a couple different reasons. But what I would advocate here um, is that when you see something bad that you at least determine what the consensus is and then figure out why is the person doing the thing that they're doing from an actual position of curiosity, not sort of like implying guilt. Um, and then explain why your perspective might differ than from their uh, experience. Okay, so detecting things that are going on um, that you might not agree with, uh, you're probably also going to be responsible for securing the data. And securing the data has lots of different aspects, including when the data is moving and when the data is at rest, um, and then making sure that the people who are accessing the data are the right people, and that their actions that they're taking with respect to the data are monitored. Again, I, I, I mentioned it in, at the beginning of 601 that this probably isn't your role, but if you're in a small organization, you're probably gonna be relied on to make sure that these things are happening. All right, so we already uh, mentioned the GDPR. That's the European um, approach to privacy on the web. There's also California's rules, as well as uh, the, what I mentioned before with healthcare for HIPAA um, and financial information you know, from banks. All right, so we've secured our data. Um, we're legally compliant. We've uh, managed it responsibly. And now we want to share it with someone else. And so this is another challenge for you, the data scientist, because you'll be in the position of making sure that if you give the data to someone else, that the information which was uh, sort of sensitive, like say a person's name or address or phone number or social security number is obfuscated. So you're getting rid of some uh, element of the data, but you still want to be able to, to get value out of it. So you still want to be able to do the analytics um, and so this, this is a real challenge to, to get right. Um, so there's uh, some, some examples of where this can go wrong. Uh, I'll, I'll provide it here in a slide. So an example of uh, a data scientist you know, probably went through an anonymized some state record 
uh, some, some records for hospital visits for state employees. And they did everything right in their perspective, right? They moved all the sensitive information. Uh, so a problem is that you, other people who are outside your organization, they can take that anonymized data and they can combine it with other data sources. And that is the complexity of anonymization is that you don't have probably good insight on how that anonymized data will be used. So in this example, um, that healthcare data that was shared from the state employees, um, they were able to de-anonymize the, the governor. Um, and so um, this is just an, an example of the, the anonymization process is complicated and messy. So um, I, I would urge a lot of caution if you're sort of requested to do that. Okay, and then, so once you've anonymized the data, um, typically um, a business might be uh, interested in selling it. Um, that means you as data scientist will probably be asked like, hey, can we buy this data you know, for our business or can we sell this data? Um, that's some aspect that you may be involved in at some point. So it's worth thinking ahead about how you're gonna handle that situation. So. Our last section on ethics here, um, basically uh, you're gonna be often tasked with an insufficient amount of data that is known to be inaccurate and people will still wanna make decisions out of it. So that'll be back onto uh, your job of making sure the data handle is handled correctly. All right, a little story time for uh, um, <laughs> the utility of predictions from data sets. So there was a uh, Target is a store that sells things right there, uh, sort of like Walmart or Shopko, right? So Target is a business that sells things and they wanted to advertise um, that they had this sale coming up. And so they looked at a person's buying history of what they had uh, bought and then they made a prediction about if, if you have bought this sequence of things, then it's likely that you'll buy this other thing. And one of the analytics that they produced was able to predict that someone is likely pregnant and therefore they can start advertising for pregnancy related topics uh, or products. And so Target ran this ad campaign and then they sent out a bunch of advertising and a person who was uh, a young woman living with her parents, uh, the parents received the mail because she was living at home and the mail indicated that she was pregnant. Uh, and so they, you know, this, this caused some consternation between that, that family. So um, there's some, some good reasons um, to sort of think ahead about how your, um, you know, analytics may have ramifications on people at a very, narrow scale, small scale. Right. Uh, yeah, so this, I think this is the last activity is to figure out how would you respond when um, someone who is not performing as well as you think they should or could. And then my last question is really my favorite, which is uh, when you're c competing or, you know, working with someone who doesn't have the same moral framework that you do, how do you uh, engage with that, right? Do you call them out? Uh, you know, do you sort of work even harder? What is your response to working with people who have different moral frameworks than you? All right. So um, there are a couple different options, right? And I'll list them out here and not read them off, uh, but there's some, certainly Lots of different ways to handle these situations. All right, so now we've finished out the cost benefit analysis sections and the ethics class and the ethics section of class. So I'll uh, finish up with a few notes. There's a student course evaluation for UMBC online. Um, that is UMBC requesting you to tell UMBC how I did as an instructor and how, the, how useful the course is. So to get there, I'll leave this link in the slides. And then there's another way to get there from Blackboard. 
So if you go down to the left hand side and click on tools, and then there's a student course evaluation option. All right, so for the end of class, what I'm looking for is an email from you where you email me uh, what advice you have for students taking the class next semester. So think a little bit about what you know now at the end of this semester that you would want to tell someone who's just starting 601 next semester. All right, with that, thank you for your attention, and I appreciate having spent the semester with you.